hearing and seeing whether women are present or not in this theory. So women's realities are these reflected or not. So from that point of view, the whole engagement of feminist jurisprudence has been the issue of discrimination, the issue of differentiation, the issue of rights, the issue of justice. So when we talk about gender justice, it not only takes the biological women being deprived into consideration, but even gender beings who are considered <laughs> like women as targets of inequality. Now that is where the third generation comes. UNDP report notes that with the onset of technology, discrimination has evolved in different ways. Technology has discriminated. With the onset of technology, where the violence has not come down, it has changed its shape. Just like how we see mobile phones being used for defaming, for circulating pictures, negative messages through WhatsApp. So how technology also plays a second fiddle to the existing condition of exploitation and denial. That's one point. UNDP also says that with the progress, development and modernization, the gender inequality does not reduce, it changes its shape. It also says that in violent situations, 95% of the victims are women, 5% of the perpetrators are women. But they say that it is not only women, but the cognitive of women in homosexual relationships also become target of violence. Is that clear? It's a, so women and women's cognitive. That's how the whole argument of gender inequality and gender violence and gender injustice to take not only women but cognates of women in other kinds of relationships <coughs> into their home. So uh, I was just discussing this. I hope till now the theoretical angle is clear. Uh, now let's come to the uh, next longer. Now, gender justice therefore is a comprehensive goal. It's a scheme of protection from exploitation and <laughs> denial. And what does the scheme entail? Participation in decision making. We earlier told that man is the head of the family. So, it is not that uh, uh, it is justice. The justice is always participation in decision making in all spheres. Finding equitable solutions not only in the family but also in the society. Desisting from stereotyping, we did the stereotyping, now we won't do that again. So that is gender justice. Historical multifold discrimination should be eliminated because everyone is a right being, autonomous, right bearing, autonomous <coughs> human being. Now, to this when you connect human rights, rights are, human rights are natural and inalienable. I told you earlier, from the natural law we draw this definition. So right to life in the constitutional scheme of things also, right to life is like a crown and from there all other rights are connected and uh, flowing. Right to liberty, right against exploitation, right to equality, right against discrimination, right to justice. Now right to be accepted as a person, security of a person, capacity to decide or act on one's behalf, equal access to property and other resources, equitable socio-economic and political support, exercise right as a full human being and support the development of others. Now, here we come across situations where this uh, uh, right to life itself is under threat as we know in case of uh, feticide and uh, even femicide. I mean, female infanticide, little child is killed by suffocation with grains or by feeding the poisonous plant juice, etc. The basis for human rights and women's rights, I told you already, it was, it was CEDAW in 1979, which gave a new platform consolidating women's human rights. Now, uh, CEDAW statement says discrimination is an obstacle to equal participation and full development. Discrimination in the form of distinguishing, in the form of excluding, in the form of restricting is the one which impairs or nullifies recognition. And it talks about modifying socio-cultural patterns and it takes maternity as a social function and that interest of children is primordial. Do we take maternity as a social function? Should we? See, this is where the three strands in equality in terms of prohibiting discrimination against women 
becomes relevant. <coughs> what are those three strands? The first strand is eliminating discrimination because it is a negative practice and doing it by arguing equality. Means you treat both men and women situated in that situation as equal. So equal, therefore equal treatment. Second, different but equal. What is that? Female body performs certain functions which are different from the male body. Female therefore has got certain socio-cultural construct and her participation in public sphere or employment or profitable activity, economically profitable activity becomes restricted because the body has to be performing that biological function at a certain age only. Now because of that, when her colleagues are overtaking uh, her in the development, she loses those opportunities because she makes a choice in favor of this biological uh, nature, biological choices. Now, isn't she entitled to make those choices? She is entitled. It is her choice. Let us respect. But is she making it only because she likes it or it is her fancy and for herself? No. There is a larger interest of her family, her in-laws, her husband, everybody. And there is also the manpower that she is contributing to the nation in nation building. So isn't this a community function that she takes over, the social function? So she is different, but then treat her equally. How do we do this? So you don't cut her service during that period. Give her the maternity leave and allow her to come back. The critical review, I mean, this is one way of theorizing. The critical review of this is, yes, it is there in the law, but law is doing only a lip service. It protects her all right. It allows her to come back to the job. But when she comes back to the job, emotionally, she is not able to disconnect from the child. Her mind, I mean, it is the biological aspect as well. Her mind is 24 by 7 in the child because that's the instinct. How does the law take care of that? Which employer gives her opportunities to get through uh, this situation by providing a mentor who has been through such situation? Doesn't. Now, that is what Rainmaker's study on legal profession, women in legal profession says, <coughs> which was published in the year 2013. I have uh, some parts of that study used in one of my talks. Uh, very interestingly, they show how women lawyers tend to undergo this glass ceiling. It is called glass ceiling. That women can grow, but only till that glass ceiling, not beyond that. The glass ceiling is the maternity wall, the, meta the wall of maternity. So how to surmount that glass ceiling? It's possible only by creating certain progressive uh, gender audit of the organization, creating mentorship, etc. So that is a critical part that I'm giving you. One of you can do a research in different professions and seeing and comparing. That's a job only a person with law degree can do who feels for justice and discrimination. So that is the second one, equal but different. The third one, is she really equal? We say that she is equal, but historically she has been deprived. She doesn't have a role model that she can look up to who has come back after giving birth to the child or got married but continued in the job. So historically for decades of independent India, large percentage of women have been uh, invisible in certain professions. So do we make reservations to give them this option? They come in, they create a revolution and then that message goes to the larger community. This is where the historical reason for promoting equality is the one which is advocating for reservation. Am I clear? Yeah, so these are the three strands of thinking or thought process which comes uh, in terms of encouraging gender equality and the mechanisms and justifying the law, uh, the implementation of the law or law reform from the point of view of encouraging emancipation and empowerment of women, the rights, human rights aspect. Now, we had the Beijing Day, I told you about all of these. Now, after this, women's human rights rep replicated in the CEDAW. They are of these categories. Now, in CEDAW, I draw your attention to two clauses. Article 5, which talks about elimination of all forms of stereotypes where the state has to take initiative, cultural and social patterns, it says. Two, Article 16. Do you believe that India has passed reservation on both of these and that says why India is still a country where a lot of rapes are happening. Unless you are determined to implement these two clauses, particularly <coughs> clause 5, article 5 of the CEDAW and article 16 which talks about 
registration, compulsory registration of marriages. Both are considered as sac sacrosanct, the definition of womanhood and manhood as cultural stereotypes and definition of marriage as an event, as a gala event in the family uh, are two things whereby gender stereotypes are reinforced and recycled <laughs> in the society. If you recall the Shabano and other cases in the Indian context, they are a classic example of how because of religion being in the core of marriage and family related laws, the equally situated or equally troubled women get different kinds of remedies. Isn't that going against the grain of human rights and issues of justice and rights? Different treatment for equally troubled, equally suffering women. So th this is how the questioning of CEDAW has happened in India in terms of passing this reservation and thereby we always question the commitment of Indian state in promoting gender equality and women's empowerment. Now none of the governments have uh, improved that situation. Domestically we have come across developments such as gender audit which was introduced in the previous government and uh, we have a lot of other developments which are happening with the government after government. But at the larger level of international commitment to gender equality, we are still in uh, the era of two reservations to CEDAW. Uh, uh, now coming to India, there are various legislations which uh, I have listed here. There are various case laws. Some of the cases have been circulated to you. I appreciate if you can come prepared on those cases by writing a small note about uh, in the background of what we discussed today, whether uh, there is a real gender justice reflected in these cases, are there biases, you, today you have learnt it in detail, what are the biases, etc. So we have seen, as Krishna Iyer said, that onslaught of womanhood is a daily reality and he says that are women human beings without rights. So uh, to such an extent Krishna Iyer goes to question the declining sex ratio, pervasive subjugation, discrimination, devaluation of their work. What is devaluation? See, two situations. One is woman's work is not taken into consideration in the national uh, capital. If at all it was taken into consideration, national capital will go up by 40 percent. Why it is not considered? Because it is considered as woman's inherent duty. And uh, the other way it is reflected, suppose there is a man who is earning certain amount of money as the sole breadwinner of the family. He could earn this because the woman is managing his home and she is doing so many other things. Let us imagine this man were to have somebody as a caretaker professionally, then he would have to pay that person. So one of the arguments is that how our tax regime is patriarchal. This is from the Irish feminists. They say that if the tax regime were to be less patriarchal, the public sphere tax regime would have taken the private sphere reality into consideration because large percentage of women manage homes, give cares. So if these women were to be working women in a profitable employment, instead of the caregiver role, they would have earned that money. So they argue that the tax regime should be making concession for certain percentage of income to be shifted, transferred to her account, the caregiver's account, because of, that, because of which she is not participating in the national economy. And to this extent, the tax would be gender audited. <coughs> Am I right? You understand? Yeah. So they say that there should be more gender equal tax regime as well, not just the uh, other aspects of human rights uh, such as employment law which are particularly targeting women. There have to be other laws. For example, maternity benefit. Can it be parental benefit? Can maternity leave be parental leave? So some such considerations are going to be very important. Now we have the case of domestic violence. India has a prevention legislation which came in 2005. There is a lot of development coming in that area. Develop, uh, domestic violence as the basis has resulted in a better bargaining position for women during the breakdown of marriage or during the troubles of marriage. Because all these cases land up in family court where counselling is the first mechanism because of which certain negotiating power has been uh, uh, assumed by women due to which by the intervention of the family court with the trained judges, there have been many marriages which have been put on a new pedestal or breakdown of the marriage has resulted in an equitable solution to women. But you have to prove or argue that there is domestic violence. <coughs> the important thing is today violence is not just about physical violence, it is also about economic violence, social violence depriving, social violence, psychological violence. So multiple